Uh, just before I, I get into God's Word this morning, I just want to uh, just show you a little picture um, that I took the other day. Um, I don't know whether anybody's ever seen that, but it only ever appears for 48 hours, and it's an oak tree flowering. Normally, it's sort of up there, isn't it? And I happen to be somewhere where I was sufficiently close. And those are the flowers on an oak tree. Who would believe that? And it's there for 48 hours. I was just amazed. Isn't God great and isn't creation great? And I just thought I'd share with that with you as just as, as a starter this morning. You know, if nothing else, we can know that God's creation is fabulous. And the interesting thing is that I was looking at it and people commenting and they say the flat, they, they're the longest they've ever seen those flowers on oak trees. Isn't that interesting? You know, who knows what God is doing at this time. So we're now going to move on to today. We're going to look at the Church of Corinth, part 14. Who would have believed we're into our second year of looking at this? Can I say, as I said last time, I'm hoping we can finish 1 Corinthians by Christmas. Uh, no, don't ask which year. <laughs> Somebody did ask me the other day and said, are you going to do 2 Corinthians? And I said, we'll see what God, how God directs us as far as that is concerned. So just so that we know, this is where we look at. And today I've titled today's message, Get Unwrapping, because we're going to look at the gifts of the Holy Spirit this morning in some detail. Just to remind us as where we've been with Paul. Paul went on a missionary journey, if you remember right at the very beginning, and he came to his place in Corinth and established a church there. He was there about 18 months, and then he moved on to Ephesus where he was there about three years, and the first book of Corinthians, or the letters that Paul wrote to the Corinthians, were written about the end of his time at Ephesus before he then went back to Jerusalem. And as we looked before, we saw that uh, in the beginning, Paul had probably received a number of communications. Let's just go on one more. There we go. A number of communications from this church. And in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 11, we know that he had a letter from the household of Chloe concerning various issues in the church, and those were really covered in the first six chapters. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, he says, now concerning the things of which I wrote to you, um, the various bits and pieces, and we get that there. And in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 17, these guys, Stephanus, Fortunus, and Acacius came, and they brought some communication, and they also brought other bits and pieces as far as that was concerned. And you see, last time we managed seven verses... Yeah, I know, we did really well, didn't we? Well, actually, today we're going to do even better because we're only going to look at verses 7 through to 11. So let's just turn to 1 Corinthians 12 and let's read God's Word to for this morning. 1 Corinthians 12, picking up in verse 7, and it says the following, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, and to another the working of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another discernings of spirits, and to another different kinds of tongues, and to another interpretations of tongues. But to one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for your word. Father, as we start to unpick this passage this morning, we just pray that we will just know an understanding of your heart for this particular church. And Father, for your heart for us as individuals, that Father, we may move on each one with you. Day by day, we pray. Amen. For those of you who are saying after the end we finish this morning, if you want a whole lot more, well, just to let you know, I actually, some of you may remember, we spent a little while looking at the foundations of our faith back in 1922. No, 2022, not 1922. I would be very old then. 
Um, when I looked at in a great deal of detail on the fruits of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we spent about four hours on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. No, we're not going to do that this morning. But if you want to go back, just search Foundations on the church website and you will find all of the teaching there. So I just thought I'd leave that there for if you want a bit more detail than what we're going to cover this morning. So let's just have a little look and let's just clarify a few bits and pieces. One of the sort of things that we see in there is a difference between fruit and gifts of the Holy Spirit. If you like, fruit is what we are. It's all about our character. God wants to refine our characters so that we are more like Jesus. And hopefully each and every one of us want to be more like Jesus in the way we respond, in the way we live. Because after all, when you're standing in that supermarket queue and the printer hasn't printed your receipt for the fourth time, you know, when you press the button, and there are three of the, and you you know, you're really sort of standing there going, it's all right. And you need to know the patience, just patience of God in that circumstances. I was trying to get through very quickly. But you see, it's all about character. It's all about how people read us. What you've got to remember is that the people around us and our neighbours, they look at us and they should be seeing Jesus. And it's interesting that I was talking to one of our neighbours this morning, I took the dogs for a walk and one of them went up to our neighbour whose washing machine blew up at two o'clock this morning and he's loading the remnants of this charred mess into his car to take it to the tip. And I said to him, I was just talking to him, and he was obviously a bit upset. And I said to him, I'll pray for you as I'm walking the dogs around the field. And he said, thank you. He said, of course, you're one of those Christians, and you believe it, don't you? He said, because even your dogs like me. (laughs) I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I've got a cat. And most people don't like me, and they don't like me because I've got... Why do you not like me? But you see, he obviously knows that we've never talked to this guy about church. He's a guy on his own. He lives in a, you know, and he lives a bit of a solitary life. But I was obviously there at the right time and just was able to just say to him, I'll pray for you. Because he's, he's going through a tough time at the moment. But you see, the fruit of the Spirit is what we should actually... B, the character, it's our character. And as I put down here, gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is what we're looking at this morning, is that what we have, if you like, they're tools in a toolbox for ministry at a particular point in time. And it's vital that we have a full toolbox. So let's just have a look for a minute at Galatians chapter 5. Because... It is critical when you're particularly looking at the church at Corinth. And it says in Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Oh, Lord, I wish we had more of that. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You see, these are the fruits. And if you like, a number of them were severely lacking in the meetings in the church in Corinth, particularly gentleness and self-control. And when we look at chapter 14, we'll see how much they were lacking self-control in the meetings. And you see, it's interesting that Paul says here in verse 24, it says, those who are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. You know, how many of us, when somebody cuts us up on the motorway, do we respond? Driving down the motorway yesterday afternoon, and I'm sure there was a guy on the motorway who just wasn't going to let me move out. You know, he came up, and I said, I said to Helen, I said, oh, for goodness sake, go past. And he sort of drew up level, and there was a lorry coming, and I think, I don't want to get out there. And I must admit, and I will confess this before you (laughs) 
Later on, I overtook him when he was stuck behind a lorry. <laughs> And I said, so I'd be honest with you, when we arrived where we were, I actually said, Lord, you know, maybe you were trying to teach me something about the whole situation at the time. And I must admit, my flesh was not very crucified yesterday in that circumstances. <laughs> but we have to have a heart where we want God to change us. Because if we don't, we're just like the world. And if Paul is saying, you know, we've got to have gentleness and self-control, particularly self-control when we are talking to people and as we relate one to another. And I just want to clarify something else as well. And I was talking to Penny about this earlier on. And that there is a difference between, and the church gets very confused and hopefully us, we won't get confused. There is a difference between giftings, which is ongoing ministry and calling, and the gift for a specific time. And we're going to differentiate between the two so that hopefully we leave here with an understanding. So gifting or ministry is an ongoing. It's a calling. We should see the fruit of it in somebody's life. I will use my, uh, hopefully you can see, and we'll look at a bit of the passage in a minute. I know, for example, I've got the gifting of teaching. Hopefully I've refined it over a few years, and hopefully you can see the fruit of it. For me, I'm not a prophet. But that doesn't mean to say I can occasionally have the Holy Spirit move and bring something that is prophetic or prophetic words. You see, a gift is given by God for a specific time and place. Whereas a gifting is an ongoing ministry where the Holy Spirit has been refining us over a period of time. So let's just jump on a little bit to, in towards the end of chapter 12 because I want to just look at that. And it says in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27, it says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And we will be looking next time about what it means to be part of the body of Christ. But in today, we're just going to look, and it says in verse 28, and he's just pointed these in the church. First of all, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles. Then gifts of healings. But you see, he doesn't stop there, does he? He said gifts of helps, gifts of administrations, variety of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healings? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But he then goes on to say, but earnestly desire the best gifts, yet I show you a more excellent way. You see, Paul's list here is of giftings. These are ongoing ministries. You see, apostles called to establish churches, oversee churches. Can I say, out there, you will get many who call themselves apostles, and they are clearly not. I'm going to say it for what it is. It tends to go among certain church streams where they call people bishops and apostles and apostle this and apostle that, when in actual fact they aren't really. But that doesn't mean to say there isn't the correct way of running a church where we have some kind of apostolic input. And the thing I always say is, it says, by their fruit you will know them. There are those who are prophets, who clearly have that sort of edge to their ministry. We've been very fortunate over the years to see people who have prophetic ministry, people like Lance Lambert, Derek Prince, Stuart Dool, to name some, who were with, have gone to be with glory. Stuart Dool was involved with Barnabas Fund and for Intercessors for Britain. I was just thinking today, and there are a number around today who bring the prophetic word to God's church. People like Clifford Hill and Tony Pierce, and there are one or two others. But I like what a guy by the name of Johnny Barr, who was a leader in the church I was in when I was a young Christian, who's ministered here as well in this church, who used to have a particular phrase when it comes to the prophetic. 
He said, if you're going to bring a prophetic word in a church, make sure you're prepared to stay around for at least five years so we know whether or not to stone you. (laughs) That was a principle in the Old Testament that if you brought something prophetic or you brought a prophetic word, if it didn't happen, they took you outside the camp and they stoned you. You see, we have to be those as Christians who are not only discerning, but we're prepared to bring something such that we are prepared for it to be tested. Some of you may remember or know of a guy by the name of Keith Horobin. Keith and um, his wife, Pauline, used to come here on a regular basis. They ran a ministry called Micah Mobile, Mobile Ministry, and they took Bibles into houses in Cornwall. That's what they did. They would go into a village, they would take hundreds of Bibles, and guided by the Holy Spirit, they would knock on doors and put Bibles through those doors. Keith had a cutting-edge ministry, but he was also quite prophetic. And can I I remember that whenever he was ministering to people, and he felt God was giving some kind of prophetic word into their life, He would turn to his wife and they'd get the dictating machine out and they would hold it and they would record it and then at a later point in time an email would come through with a transcript of what they felt God had said in your life. For me, that's accountability. That was somebody who was prepared to say, I believe God has spoken, this is what God has spoken, here you go, have it, take it away and test it. We need to be in that position. And then he talks about those who walk in the area of miracles. <clears throat> there are many people who claim miracles. And I would, we need to differentiate between what is a miracle and what is a healing. And I like to say that a, a miracle is something where something creative happens. Or we see the raising of the dead. And that's people who move in a particular area and a particular ministry. And I'll give you an example. We had somebody who came and spoke in this church who had been involved in a ministry in Africa. And on one occasion, they ran out of fuel. And God said to them, what have you got? And they said, we've got water and orange juice. So God said, you need the water, put the orange juice in the car. And it did 500 miles on orange juice. That was a miracle. They needed the water to drink, so they put the orange juice in the car and it did 500 miles. It talks about here the the Ministry of Helps. And I may have shared this before, but we came across a lady a few years ago who clearly, that was her ministry gifting. She was, her husband was involved in a technical ministry team who used to provide PA for us when we were running Bible Weeks down in Cornwall. And this lady had MS. Her husband was very technical, he was great, he he was great rigor, he was a very strong guy. And what used to happen was that these guys used to bring their equipment down to Cornwall in a seven and a half ton truck. And she would set the tailgate at about this sort of height and a table. She had a little cooker and she had mugs and knives and forks and spoons and gaffer tape along the edge of this tail lift. And she would write your name and her mind would be T plus M. Some people would be C plus M plus S. That was coffee with sugar and milk. And you would have your mug, and she would virtually constantly keep those mugs. She had a bell, because she'd got very little voices. She'd have a bell, and when the bell rang, it meant she had restocked the mugs. And if you've ever rigged PA for 2,000 people in a massive barn, I can tell you the half hour and the hot and the sticky that it was, that was a real ministry. That's what she could do. And she used to make sandwiches and put them there on the plate. And it would mean mine would be H plus P, ham plus pickle. <laughs> and that's what she did. And with her little two-burner cooker, water, 
and a kettle, she would make tea and coffee for those who were doing stuff. That was a ministry of helps. We've got ministry of administrations. Those who organize stuff. And if you see that happening, that is a miracle. Somebody who really has that gift of administration. And it says, variety of tongues. There is people who have that particular ministry who regularly bring something, and this gifting is particularly, speaks to unbelievers. And Paul gives us this rhetorical question, doesn't it? Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, etc.? And the answer is no. But what Paul is saying here, he said, but earnestly desire the best gifts. We need to desire from God. What is our gifting? What does God want us to do? And can I say what the one that they've left out of here, that Paul left out, was the, the gift of encouragement. So many times we need people to come alongside us and say, that was good. You're doing well. Keep going. And if that's your gift... Can I say, ask God to let you grow it, because that is vital for the church today. But you see, the best gift is the one that you are called to do, not that somebody else suggests it might be for you to do. And it says, the most excellent way is God's way. So look, having looked at giftings, now let's get back to our core passage for this morning, and let's go back to the beginning of the chapter. And you see, it says here, verse 7 is the key verse for the whole of this chunk that we're looking at today. But it says in verse 7, it says, but for the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one to build them up. No. No. In the corporate body, it is for the profit of all. It's for the building up of the church. You see, we need to be the spiritual gifts there are the abilities given to believers that exceed our natural human ability. Given by God to enable us to function in a spiritual capacity. In order to do that, we have to be full to overflowing of the Holy Spirit. So that when we encounter people, and when we are in the church, we are able to function in such a way that it builds people up. So it says here in verse 8, and it says we're going to pick them off one by one as we look through this morning. And I'm going to take the first two basically together, and it says the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Can I say often they go together? You can have a word. Solomon was one who had great wisdom, and if you like, that was a gifting. We're talking about here you have wisdom in a one-off circumstances and a situation. Knowledge is knowing about what the problem is, and it may be shown supernaturally. And wisdom is about knowing what to do about it. I cite an example of years ago, we used to, in this church, we used to have healing meetings on a sort of bi-monthly basis when people could bring their sick friends and relatives and we would seek God to see healing happen. And we saw numerous people healed. Numerous people come to the Lord as a result. And on one particular Sunday evening, I was paired with somebody in the church and there was a local vicar brought his daughter to be prayed for. If you like, she was, she'd been at secondary school, she was at a, um, a boarding school, and she'd come home just before Christmas very unwell. In fact, basically, these walls were probably paler, she was paler than these walls. Looked like a ghost. And this chap brought his daughter forward and said, she's not very well, can you pray for her? So the lady who was paired up with me said, what's the problem? And she said, well, since she's returned to school, she has been on her period constantly since that time, since September, and hasn't stopped. And we said, okay, we'll pray. 
And we're sat there and we're praying and we're not getting anywhere. If you've ever prayed for somebody, you know whether or not you're getting anywhere. We just weren't getting anywhere. So I ushered one of those arrow prayers that said, Lord, I need some help. Maybe I should have done that about five minutes earlier, but there we go. And this young lady was sat there like this, and then she dropped her left hand down like this. And there dropped out from underneath her jumper or whatever it was, one of those friendship bands, basket band things that a lot of people wear. Don't have God origin, can I say. And at which point I said, what's that? And she said, oh, it's a friendship band we all made together at the end of the last school year, some who were leaving, and, you know, so that we'd always remind ourselves of each other. And I asked the question, I said, are your friends well as well? And she said, no, we're all the same, we're all ill. All with the same condition. I said, okay. We're going to cut that. God said to me, cut the friendship band. I won't go into the background as to why, but I, God said to me. So I, I went into the church kitchen, where there's a, we don't have it anymore, but it, so we will have one at home. You know that sort of drawer that you have that has everything in it? Yeah? Everybody had, when we had our kitchen redone, the, the designer said, you need a kitchen drawer. I said, what do you mean? He said, the one that you have all the bits in. We had one in the church kitchen, church kitchen, and I knew there was a pair of scissors in that drawer. So I went in and I got what I thought was a decent pair of kitchen devil scissors, you know, the ones that you can cut anything with, and I started to try and cut this friendship bat. Guess what? Couldn't cut it. It's only woven cotton, isn't it? So in the end, a bit desperate, I went out to the car where I had a pair of wire cutters in the car, in those days when you lugged around 25 kilos of toolbox. Went in the car, got the wire cutters, and cut it. It was like, it's almost cutting steel. Immediately, her colour came back. And she said, it stopped. She knew that she'd been healed. If you like, it was a word, you know, there was wisdom and knowledge running together that actually saw healing happen. In fact, when we cut the friendship band, suddenly she was healed. The interesting thing that goes on with that, and we spoke to her dad a period of time later on, and he said, guess what? All, she went back to school in the January, told her friends to do exactly the same thing, who'd all been ill through the whole of the whole term and Christmas. And guess what happened? They were all healed as well. But you see, it was knowledge and wisdom running together. Let's just have a look at another example. In 2 Kings chapter 5, here's an example. And we find this guy, Naaman. Naaman was a influential man in his time, and he said, Naaman had leprosy, okay? And it says in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, and Naaman went with his horses and his chariots, and he stood at the door of Elisha. Elisha was the prophet. He was the man of God. He was the one who people had seen numerous miracles happen through his life. And Elisha, so he stood at the door of Elisha's house, and it says, Elisha sent a message to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you shall be clean. And it said, Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, surely he will come out to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord, and of his God, and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Can you see what happened? You see... Naaman was told how to get healed. You see, Elisha didn't even come to the door. He sent his servant. And Naaman got really, really angry. It says he became furious. You see, what was actually his problem? God wanted him to humble himself before God. And then he was healed. 
eventually, as we read further on, okay? But you see, Elisha had wisdom into how to deal with Naaman. Didn't go to the door himself, he sent his servant, because he knew that the issue that Naaman had was with pride and humility. And eventually, he went to the Jordan, and he did wash himself seven times, and guess what happened? He was healed. You see, was the water of the Jordan special? No, there was nothing special about the water. What was important was that that word of wisdom that Elisha had told him what to deal with the situation. The root of the problem in his life was the leprosy was just a symptom. There was deeper things that needed to be dealt with in his life, and God dealt with them. Let's deal with knowledge. Let's have a look at an example of knowledge. In Acts chapter 5, you see, knowledge is not learned. It's the supernatural impartation that could be known or could not be known without God intervening. And it says here, and it says, a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, and his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? After it was sold, was it not in your control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. And it says, and then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his laugh. In other words, he died. So great fear came upon those who heard these things, and the young men arose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. You see, this is what happened. But you see, in verse 3, Peter was given knowledge. He did not know that how much they'd sold the property for. Because Ananias brought, and he's just brought this money. But you see, had they, was, it, was it wrong to keep some of it back? No. What was wrong was they gave the impression was that they had brought all of it to the church. Because that's what people were doing at that particular time to meet a particular need. Basically, he lied. And it was revealed to Peter. And the consequences of his action was that actually fear came upon the church. Yes, he died. One man died. But fear of God came upon the church. And the church moved forward in a big way. So we find faith. It's not saving faith. It's supernatural faith, knowing that something is going to happen. Let's turn to Acts 14. In Acts 14, it says the following, And in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. So we don't know how old he was, but if it says a man, he must have been at least 14. I suspect older than that. Never walked in his life. And it says, This man heard Paul speaking, and Paul observing him intently, and seeing that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he leapt, and he walked. You see, Paul recognized the faith in the man to be healed, and in verse 10, you see, he actually took some action. How many of us would have said, right, stand up, knowing full... You've probably seen him numerous times in, by the temple. Okay? Stand up. Can you imagine what that would have happened? You see, it was determined by God that this was the time for this healing. You see... He gave this manifestation of healing in this man's life. He stood up and he leapt and he walked. And you see, what happened was that we got a miracle happened there. So let's move on to the next one. And that is miracles. That is the mighty demonstrating of God's power where there isn't any possibility. Can I say that miracles, we just have that word miracles, but actually in God's word, this actually has a root, dynamos. 
dynamite, explosive power. And you see, it's a demonstration of God's mighty power. We see this, for example, in the Bible, in the casting out of demons. We see it in the power over the elements, raising the dead. So let's have a little look at an example in Acts chapter 8. And in verse 32, have I got the right passage there? I'm sure I have. Chapter 9, yes, Acts chapter 9. Sorry, I've got the wrong one in my slide. We'll go back to that one. So Acts chapter 9, let's have a look at that one. I'll have to read it from here, not on the slide. Thank you. This is what happens when you prepare over two days. Um, I'm sure it is. The 32, let's just look at that one. I'm sure it is. Yes. Okay, Acts, sorry, it's Acts chapter 9, 32. And it says, Now it came to pass, as Peter was going through all the parts of the country, he came down to the saints and dwelt at Lydda, and he found a certain man called Aeneas, who'd been bedridden for eight years and was paralyzed. And he said, and Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you, arise and make your bed, and he rose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Look what happens when we get a miracle. Okay, look at the fruit of it. Okay, and many, all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. It's important that we actually see that. Okay, when we see God move in the miraculous way, we will see fruit in people's lives. And let's move on. The next one is prophecy. And can I say there are two types of prophecy? There is the foretelling, which is dealing with a now situation, and there is foretelling, which is talking about the future. Now, as we were discussing, there is a prophetic word going round at the moment about the church needs to get his act together. You may have seen it from a guy who runs a church down in, in Fareham. He is saying, that is a now prophetic word, he's basically saying, church, if you don't get your act together, God's going to close you down. And those who are determined to go on with God, he will keep going. And it's important that for us, we need to be those who are actually moving on in the things of God so that we actually know that what is going on. So let's just have a look and let's just see as we move on there. Acts chapter 11. Acts 11 and verse 27 says the following. In those days, prophets came from, Ant from Jerusalem to Antioch. And then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and showed by the Spirit there was going to be a great famine throughout the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, each according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brethren dwelling in Judea. And this they did, and sent it to the elders by the hands of of Barnabas and Saul. You see, here we had a prediction there was going to be a famine. And as a result of that, the di disciples witnessed to it. The church witnessed to it, and they decided to send relief. They sent supplies to their fellow believers. You see, anybody who brings prophecies, any prophetic words, must be open to testing, as I've mentioned previously. You know, we need to be open to what the Lord is saying. We need to judge with the Word of God. Does it line up with the Word of God, what is being said? And we need to be open to that which is happening. And then we see we need to, the next one is discernings of spirits. Oh, that is one that we so need in the church. Can I say, that is a gift that those who do the door ministry need 
to have him functioning when they stand on the door. I cite the example, and I've quoted this before, when we were running our Bible week back in Worcester, we had a group turn up, and we'd seen them a number of times, and somebody who was on the door on one occasion who was really moving in the things of the Spirit turned round and challenged them and said, you're witches. You imagine that when this group walks up to the door. You guys are witches. And they were rather taken aback by this. And he said, yes, and you've come to disturb the meetings. And he said, and he actually he had words up with them, and he said, you can come. But he said to one of them, you have to leave your rucksack outside. We'll look after it for you. I said, what? Why do I need to leave my rucksack outside? Later on, it was incredibly heavy. Because what they had done and what they were doing is that they had witches, when they curse something and they come, they, they put in little altars in the building. And they were putting little piles of stones in the building. And at the end of the morning meeting, a number, I went into the gents and I went into the WCs, and there on the floor in the corner were these little piles of five stones. They'd been to the loo when they'd arrived. And when we finished the morning meeting and we said to them, if you come again, you're going to have to make sure you're saved and you've got your lives right with God, they never came back. But the interesting thing was, by two of the pillars, guess what we found in the meeting? Little piles of stones. And the other thing that we found was that um, we found, just before we were due to start the meetings, we found a totem pole in the woods on site. And when we went to the farmer, went to the farmer whose farm it was, and we said, oh, by the way, um, do you know there's a totem pole in the woods? And he went, no. I said, oh, well, it's not there anymore, because we took it down. We didn't think it was yours. And the farmer lent this guy a chainsaw, and he, tried, he cut it up and went through three chainsaw blades, brand new ones, cutting up this totem pole, because it was a mark of the occult. But you see, he had discerned that in these people, they'd come to disrupt the meetings. And you see, let's just have a look now, and let's see if we've got it right. Yes, yeah, Acts chapter 8. Let's look in Acts chapter 8 and verse 18. And it says the following in Acts 8 and verse 18, and it said, When Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Can I say, there are those today who run conferences so that you can go and be filled with the Holy Spirit and they charge you to attend. Can I say, you do not need to attend any conference to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You do not need to go anybody with anybody with a special anointing. Just ask God to fill you afresh. I do it on a fairly regular basis. The reason why I'm a bit like a calendar. I leak. I live in a world that tries to prevent me moving in the power of the Holy Spirit. But let's see what happens here. It says, but Peter said to him, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter. And this is what he discerns. He says, your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness and pray that perhaps God, if perhaps through your heart, may be forgiven you. For I see, not with his eyes, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. You see, he saw what was going on behind the situation. And he discerned that this was the problem. And as a result of that, Simon said, I answer, pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. The point being is he discerned what was going on and was able to pin it down. And it's interesting that the Bible always talks about this. And it says, of course, that, that you see, bitterness, the root of bitterness 
will destroy. Bitterness is the rottenness of the bones. And you see, one of the things that he, what he hadn't done is that he, as we know, he was a Christian, he'd be baptized. They wouldn't have baptized him if he wasn't. But basically, he hadn't had a clear out. It's interesting that in Africa, when a lot of people come to Jesus, what do they do? A lot of them go home and burn their hut. Because why? Because their huts are full of fetishes and bits and pieces and stuff of the occult. And when they come to Jesus, they have to have a clean house. We as Christians need to make sure that when we come to Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, we don't actually hinder the moving of the Holy Spirit by what we have at home. Years ago, in my, before I was a Christian, I had a massive record collection. Massive numbers of singles, because I, I used to actually go to parties and do stuff like that. And God told me, get rid of it. It's a hindrance. And I got rid of my record collection. What we need to be is be open before the Lord as to does he need us to have a clear out in our homes? If we had time this morning, we could look at when Elijah called Elisha. What did he do? Go and look at it in, I think it's 1 Kings 19 or thereabouts. What did Elisha do? He went home, killed the oxen, and cooked them with his plow. He was the firstborn son of the family. And by doing that, there was no way back. He was saying when he was called, I'm going with you, and I'm not going back to my old life. Maybe we need to be those who have a quick spring clean. Can we say one thing? Years ago, we were given a present by my aunt. She had been to South Africa, and she brought us back this statue. And can I say, when I got it, and we brought it home, and we put it in our house, and immediately the sense of the presence of God went from where we were living. I couldn't pray in the Spirit. Something happened. And God said, it's that. When I discovered, just before I destroyed it, that it was some carved image of an African god which my aunt had bought on the stall, and she thought it was quite nice, and it looked like... So I decided I was going to destroy it, because that's what God said. So I went to the shed, and I got out a saw, right? Now, if you know me, I'm quite fastidious about sharp tools. And I went, and I tried to cut the head off this statue, to put it in the bin. Okay. So I tried various saws in my attempts to destroy this item. I broke two chisels trying to destroy said item. In the end, the only way I managed to destroy it was with a cold chisel and a seven-pound club hammer. And can I tell you, interestingly enough, once I'd split it, I could saw it up with a, with a nail file. Once I had broken its power, it just destroyed so easily. We need to be those who are, the, uh, because you see what it says here, bound by iniquity, iniquity is the worship of other gods. And that was in his life, false god worship. Let's just look at 2 Corinthians 11. We're just going to jump on to book 2. But you see, when the discernings of spirits, Paul says the following, but what I do, I continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. These were things that were coming in to the church. Because look at what he says in verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. 
Satan will try and deceive us. Interestingly enough, what is one of the signs at the end of the times? Look at it in Matthew. Deception will try and get in in the midst of the church. And we need to be those who are really wise to that deception. We need to be wise and dis- able to discern the things. Ask God to give you that gift so you will be able to interpret the things that are going on. And let's look at tongues and interpretation. In other words, to speak a language not learned and supernaturally enabled. It's always towards God and it's always in praise of him and it's very rarely prophetic, or that doesn't mean to say that God can't give a word of prophecy through an interpretation. Interpretation should always be, if you feel the Holy Spirit moving upon you and you feel a tongue coming, what I would say is quickly usher a prayer and say, Lord, let's have an interpretation. Make sure there's somebody here who's prepared to interpret this or be prepared to give it yourself. But you see, in Acts chapter 2, we find the following. And it said, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came from sound of heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they appeared to them divided as tongues of fire and sat upon each one of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. As the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. <coughs> Is that my time up? <laughs> Not quite. And there was dwelling in Jerusalem devout Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred and the multitude came together, they were confused because they heard everyone speaking in their own language. Can I say, there are numerous testimonies of people who have spoken in tongues and somebody in the meeting has, said, has been, have recognized it as their own language. Somebody is then given an interpretation and the person who recognized it, who spoke both what was brought, has said, yeah, that was right. But look what happens. And they were amazed and marveled, saying to one another, look... Are not those who speak Galileans, Galileans rather, how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? And then I've listed the whole list. And we pick up in verse 11, it says, We hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, Whatever could this mean? Jump to the end of the chapter, 3,000 got saved that day. Wouldn't any of us like to be in that revival? You know, as we sung that hymn, that was what Helen brought to me. That hymn that Dave had picked. Verse 4, Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send revival, start the work in everybody else. No, it says, start the work in me. If we are moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, we will have that word that in season for somebody so that we can speak to them and we can start them on maybe the first opportunity to bring them on that journey to coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. After all, that's what it's all about. God is very urgently saying, we need to get out there, folks. We need to be proclaiming the gospel. And one of the biggest ways is when we are equipped with those gifts to be able to say to people, this or that. If you remember Jesus when he met the woman at the well, didn't he? And she said, he said, go and get your husband. And she said, no, the man I was not my husband. And Jesus then turned around and said, yeah, and neither was the other five. It was a word that brought her to himself so let's just finish up and it says here in verse 11 of the original passage and I said well there we go we've only done those verses it says the following but each one and the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills you see we need to make sure it's God that's giving us those the Holy Spirit is a dove Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus as a dove, but he's also a fire. Let's not scare the Holy Spirit away in our responses, but let's be open to moving in the power of the Holy Spirit, able to do the things that he would have us do, so that we as a church 
may be known for those who are a people of God, moving in the things of God. So let's just finish with a question. Where are we at? You know, firstly, it says, are we saved and are we changed, or are we still living like the world? We need to make sure the flesh is crucified for those of us who know Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord. The passage I put up there, 1 John 1 verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, say to God, look, I'm a sinner. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness so that we can know that we are living with him. Are we living by faith and living in the fullness of the Holy Spirit? I have to keep saying, God, just fill me afresh today that I can say the things I need to say. And are we open for him, God, to move through us in the power of the Holy Spirit? And I added that one statement on the end, and it says, do we fear man rather than fear God? That is vital in the days that lie ahead. As we see the things that would try and make us afraid to speak out. You know, we see it on our TVs. They bombard us now with things that would try and make us afraid. We need to be moving in the boldness and the strength and the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's just pray. (coughs) Father God, we have just sung earlier on, I praise thee, Lord, for cleansing me from sin. Fulfill thy word and make me pure within. Fill me with fire where once I burned with shame. Grant my desire to magnify thy name. Father God, we just come before you this morning. Fill us afresh with the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, just fill me afresh with the power of your Holy Spirit that I may be effective for you, moving in those gifts that you need us to do on a daily basis. Father, may we see here in this place the gifts of the Holy Spirit in action, words of wisdom and knowledge, gifts of healing, discernings of spirits, You're moving in power, the overflow of the Holy Spirit in tongues and interpretations of tongues, that we might be a mighty and effective people for you. If you want God just to fill you afresh, let's just raise our hands before the throne of God for a moment or two and say, Father, just ask him to fill you afresh with the power of his Holy Spirit, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Father, help us to be more like Jesus, moving in the power of the Holy Spirit in the days that lie ahead. We pray now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.